Pastor Mike and Kim are in Colorado, and they have been. They took off, I think it was last Thursday. I mean, it's, it's pretty pathetic. I've got I to, gotta, like, catch my, my breath just by bringing that across the stage. You guys got to give me a break here for a second. <laughs> What's that, Bobby? I mean, yeah, I mean, that gets your heart beating. I guess a little worth, though, that, that does that, right? That's okay. But they, they're in Colorado. Uh, they went to a, uh, a church out there that Pastor Mike's associated with. He's, I think, on their board of overseers out there. And so uh, the pastor's wife out there is going through uh, some type of cancer treatment, chemotherapy, that sort of thing. So she's doing well with it. It's just that uh, them going out there, giving him a break. Uh, Pastor Mike spoke on Sunday morning. I think he was going to speak tonight also. So just kind of one of those uh, times where, you know, they go just to be a blessing and then at the same time, I think uh, they're going to try to hook up with his brother, which is about four or five hours away also. So they'll be back. I believe they're scheduled to come back in on Friday. So they'll be here this weekend. So that'll be a good thing. Now, the first thing we really want to do, now this is very serious, guys, okay, is that we need to have some intense intercession for my St. Louis Cardinals tonight. <laughs> It's game six, they're down three to two in the series, and it's back in Boston, so I'm just, I'm joking, of course, it's, it's okay, it's all right. Hey, I wanted to speak to you a little bit tonight about truth, some truths about truth, if, if we can put it that way, which is kind of interesting, but I really believe that uh, this is something that God just started stirring in me, but I, I feel like it's a lot more prophetic for, uh, not just for us as uh, currently, you know, individual believers in the Lord, but I feel like it's uh, almost like a prophetic word for especially the church here in America. Um, not that I'm speaking to the church in America, but, but that's the way I kind of feel about it or get a sense about it. I, I, I just sense like this is something that not only is he doing here, but he's doing throughout uh, America and about our nation here for the believers uh, that are following him. But there's two things really that I want to talk to you about tonight is number one is the people of God. We need to have a love for the truth and we need to ingest it as much as possible. So we need to have a love for truth and we need to ingest it as much as possible. And, and secondly is that we need to be the uh, standard barriers or the purveyors of the truth also um, because the world uh, and certainly our country is depending upon the church being the church i know that the lord is depending upon the church being the church in this day and in this hour right now so i want to talk to you a little bit about those two things and the way that this really started to resonate in my heart was uh i would been studying something a little bit different here recently and it just kind of brought this viewpoint brought a different viewpoint to me and how I saw things and how I was reading things and when I was reading it even though it was different I was able to digest there was something in me that said yes this is right I, I it's palatable it's it's hitting my inner core, and I can tell that it's truth even though it's different, okay? And so it really made my heart begin to cry, Lord, I want the truth. I want the truth. I don't want to walk in any type of deception. Uh, that is a big statement right there because all of us, if we tell the truth, even though we may not know it, we are walking in deception of some sort. Because God's got us on this journey of exposing Himself and forming Himself in us. And as He continues to do that and brings light and truth into us, uh, it, it drives out the darkness. Okay? Our, our spirit is completely sanctified. There is no darkness in our spirit for the born-again believer. But don't you know, though, that our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, 
That's the area that we have the problem with, that it's still being worked upon by the Holy Spirit. And so as the Holy Spirit brings light and truth into us, it's a good thing. When I was reading the stuff and I was studying this, it just brought such a, a sense of refreshing and cleansing in the inward parts. It was just like, wow, God, I, I, want, I want more of the truth. I don't want to be walking in any type of deception. The, the other thing is that I had seen about a conference that was going on here just recently, a couple weeks ago. And I won't tell you who it was put on by, but basically there were some people that put it on where they are sensationist. Cessationist. It's a hard. They're not sensational. They're cessationist, which basically means that they believe in the Holy Spirit. They believe in the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit bringing about the fruit in our lives as believers. But when it comes down to the supernatural, when it comes down to the spiritual gifts of words of knowledge and words of healing and miracles that we just prayed for tonight. They don't believe that that happens anymore. That that ceased with the apostles in the first century. And no longer do we need that because we have the Word of God now. And the Word of God, as we all know, we, we, we eat that. We, that's what we base everything upon. But at the same time, we also know that the Holy Spirit and God, God's contained in this book, the description of Him and how he operate, operates. But God's not all of this book. Does that make sense? God, God is much larger. There's things in here that the church still hasn't gotten a hold of yet because the time hasn't been ready for the scrolls to be opened. There's things that we haven't been able to comprehend yet because God hasn't shown His light on it yet. And this is in this book, let alone... God Himself who resides in the heavenlies and how powerful and awesome and multifaceted He is. So God's in this book, definitely. We love this book. This is what we base our doctrine on. This is what we base our teaching on. But God is bigger than the book. The thing that bugged me about this, because they had little prom- promotional videos just kind of asking different questions and then different speakers would just give like a little two-minute reply. So it was little promotional videos. And it would be questions like, you know, what did the charismatic movement really bring to the earth? You know, what's its lasting hallmark? And then they would answer the question. And, And actually, there was, I listened to three different guys. There was two guys that I sat there the whole way and I was like, I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement with this guy. That's fantastic. Yeah, the Holy Spirit is at work. He is bringing fruit in our lives. He is a sanctifier, okay? But there was one gentleman that I was listening to that had just kind of a, a smug smugness about him. And it wasn't really as much of his response, even though I didn't agree with his response, but it was the spirit or the attitude that he conveyed while he was giving his response. That he, it made you feel like he had the right interpretation of Scripture. And if you want to know the right interpretation of Scripture, you come to this gentleman because he knows truth from error. And which we do need to have confidence. But when it comes with an arrogance then that's when we've crossed the line. Because charismatics, there is weird things that happen in that realm. But you know what, guys? There's weird things that happen in any realm. I was in banking for 10, 12 years, that sort of thing. You know what they do in banking? We deal with real bills. But also, don't you know, there's counterfeiters out there. Anytime that you have something real of the Spirit, there's always going to be something of the flesh that's counterfeit. It does not negate the truth and the realness 
of what God is doing, the enemy just tries to sow confusion in the midst of it so that you take this here and you go, you know what? If, it, if I'm going to get this, then I am throwing that out the door. And you know what? I'm not going to go by any type of personal experience because if I have a personal experience with the Holy Spirit, that may freak me out. And I fear, I don't fear the work of the Holy Spirit and the fruit, but I fear the Holy Spirit and the work of something that I cannot control. And as far as my Bible's concerned, I think the last time I read, I think it's in one fifteen that God sits in heaven and he does whatever he pleases. So see, so many times I think, you know, folks try to, put God in that box and God's not saying I'm not in any box you know I, I'm not going to do that I'm not going to be part of that privy to that sort of thing so those are the two things that really began to kind of get me say Lord you know I was praying for this guy today because there's and if I said the name there's probably most of you know it and, he, and he's got some things that are right on. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm not against the man at all. If, if you're in Christ, hallelujah, then we got something major that we can agree on. And that's what we need to do. We need to agree on. We don't need to be putting down our brothers and sisters who are in Christ because they may have a different belief about this or that. Okay? So, so I want to talk to you about the players, first of all, the players in the game of truth, but it's really not a game. <laughs> it, it, it's really all about life and death, really. We know that God the Father, and I, and I hope I'm not, I don't mean to be so simple that it seems like I'm talking down to you. I, I don't want that, but I just want to be made, make it as plain as day that the truth that God wants his church to walk in is very significant. Because he is a God of truth. It says that the, the foundation of his throne, the, the seat of his ruling power, his throne, the foundation of it is righteousness and justice. Now if we try to have righteousness and justice without truth, we don't have righteousness and justice. Our judgments become perverted our righteousness is based on false claims, and so that's not it. So God is a God of truth, and everything in his kingdom is related to truth. Okay? Matter of fact, the one thing, I won't say that it's impossible for God to do, but I'll say that he won't do it, is that God will not lie. If we tried to have a relationship with him and we caught him in a lie how could we then begin to have a relationship with him at all because we wouldn't have any confidence in the promises the scripture that are that's before us when could i believe him it's just the same in a relationship that we have on the earth if for your spouse you catch them in a lie it's like okay well now he's telling me this and he's telling me that. Well, what's the truth? What's the lie? See, so, so trust is completely eroded at that point. So God makes it very serious about truth. And that God's courts are a courts of justice. See, the courts that we have here in the earth realm, they are courts of law. And laws are made by men and also, since they're made by men, some of them are good. Some of them aren't so good, right? We, we've seen that too many times in the news with silly laws and people having to deal with the ramifications of it. But if laws are made by men, then laws can be manipulated by men. See, because now it's, about, it's not about justice, but it's about, can I hire the best uh, uh, attorney to represent me in court because he's got a charismatic gift and he can really turn it against the jury and present my case. Sometimes we get justice 
in our court system. But many times we don't get justice. But it's played out. It's a court of law. It's really neat. The, the Hebrew word for truth begins with the beginning letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It has the middle uh, letter of the Hebrew alphabet right in the middle. And the end also has the end letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So the rabbi said this. The rabbi said all of creation from the beginning to the end is upheld by truth. But you know what's very interesting is in Jesus in Revelation says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. And everything is upheld by the power of his word. Isn't that awesome? That Jesus, see, and the second person that got it, Jesus, one of his names is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That he came full of grace and truth. Grace being first. Thank God. Hallelujah, right? That he speaks truth to us, but he does it gracefully. Just like the woman at the well, when he basically just kind of slid her right open with the truth and says, you know, you've spoken right. You know, the husband that you're with right now, he's not your husband and you've had five of them. And you know what? She doesn't slink away from that. There was something about him that was so gracious, even though that may have been very truthful and cuts to the core, it actually drew her to him and opened her heart up to a greater it was a greater issue of her heart because she started talking about worship what was really in her heart and about you know you Jews say that you worship in Jerusalem and all that sort of stuff but the thing is don't you know that God can quickly when he speaks to us can cut to the heart of an issue. Have you ever gotten a cut and you didn't even know you had a cut until you look down and you're like bleeding? I've had that happen to me. And it's like, where did that even happen? I don't even know that that happened. That's the truth that Jesus Christ can bring in it. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth that he teaches us all things and he guides us into all truth. The Godhead is completely sold out on truth. The church is the next player. James 1.18 that we've been uh, studying here says that we were birthed by the word of truth and that we are to be a company of people that worship in spirit and truth. And that's about the heart. Because see, the worship wasn't about where physically that I had to go to Jerusalem or I had to go to this mountain where the forefathers began to worship. But Jesus, when he said that you will worship in spirit, he was saying that you can worship me anywhere. You can worship me in your heart, whether it's here in the sanctuary, in your car on the way home, uh, at home, in Walmart, the parking lot, although it might be a little bit challenged in the parking lot. Um, so worship, worship in the spirit, about the place, it's at the heart. The other thing is that worship in truth, that it's from the heart. See, because what had happened in the sacrificial system that God had set up, it just got to be to a point where it was a rote, just this is what we do. This is the time that we do this. Their hearts were far from the Lord. Their lips were close to Him. They were speaking the right thing, but the heart was far from Him. Big thing is, is Jesus calls the devil the father of lies, that there is no truth in him, that he is a liar. Okay? What happens with him and what makes him so deceptive is that he will take truth and he'll take the lie and he'll mix it together. So when you're being fed some of this stuff, it's like there's a little bit of that truth in it, so you're missing the lie in the midst of it also at times. And that's what causes deception. I recently read here where rat poison is 98% okay. It's 98% okay. You could eat 98% of rat poison, you'd be fine. 
but it's the 2% that'll kill you. <laughs> 2% will kill you. So that's the way it is with us when it comes to the Word, when it comes to things we're trying to discern. If, there, if that lie can sneak in a little bit and get mixed in and get clouded in that situation, then we ingest it and it's not good for us. The world. Of course, the world is completely lost and is in all different types of deception. Some people are completely lost. Uh, they don't have any type of clue whatsoever. Different philosophies, different uh, religions, Buddha, New Age, pantheism, all sorts of things that are out there. Then you've got some people who are cultural Christians. They wear the shirt that has the fish on it. And the back of my jeans may say, Jesus. Um, but there hasn't been anything going on here. And so that they believe that there is, hey, I, I've, I know the Lord. But the, God's not looking for the outward appearance. God's looking for the heart that we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts and then we're saved that those two things go together. So there's lots of things in the world that is going on right now. Uh, the problem with that is this, is that it's a, a humanistic philosophy, and we can see it uh, in the problems that are before us, the way we go about trying to solve problems. Uh, there is not a public display of, hey, we really need to call upon the Lord here. I, I'm not talking about the chaplain coming out uh, before the Senate convenes and doing the daily prayer, I'm talking about Senator such and such saying we need to get on our knees and seek the face of God because we don't have the answer. Because so we portray a very humanistic reasoning and philosophy. We think that we can go ahead and solve these things in our own wisdom. But in, in the and the word that we're all, I think, probably have heard so many different times and that we don't, really don't care for it anymore is tolerance. Like tolerance is the highest virtue. That, that's the greatest thing. Being open to someone else's viewpoint and that if you have conviction, you're closed-minded. You get labeled as, oh, you, you can't think outside the box. You don't care about other people, which is not the truth whatsoever. But I'll t tell you, God is building a home in the Spirit. And what God builds is perfectly, uh, perfectly in line. Is what I'm going to use. This here. Has anybody ever used one of these? Bobby, have you used one of these? Yeah, Plum Bob. You've used one, Alan? Exactly. This here, if my hand was stationary, which it's going to sway a little bit here. This here is the straightest line that you can possibly get. I mean, th th there's nothing straighter. If, if it wasn't moving, my hand wasn't moving, I was stationary. Then that's the straightest line. This is the absolute truth that God says, I'm going to build my house, and it's going to be based in absolute truth. That if we could see my hand being the Father in heaven, who is like a rock that changes not. And he sent his son, the rock Jesus Christ, the perfect cornerstone into the world. And I'm going to build me a house that's a, in a, a dwelling place in the Spirit. Because see, he's building a house not for us. He's building a house for himself that he wants to live in. And it, he gets to construct it. So it's completely plumb completely vertical no problems whatsoever with that but see what the world does is we take something like this and we think we got a straight line looks a little straight not too straight some people if we're really humanistic we do this thing right there is no <laughs> There is no up and down, and we, we do uh, stuff like that, and yeah, we're going to build our house. It's going to be really plumb, and it's going to be square, and 
We're going to love it and enjoy it. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So God is building a house that is completely plumb. We need to be lovers of truth ingesting it and digesting it those were the players those are the players in the game of truth i just want to share a few things about being lovers of truth first of all we're set apart and consecrated by truth in john 17 jesus said that we're concentrate or consecrated excuse me by the word of god and his word is truth that we are to be worshipers that worship in spirit and in truth in psalm 51 6 david said this in the midst of his uh, repentance after the whole Bathsheba affair. He says, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. God wants truth in the inward parts. Why does God want truth in our inward parts? Because he knows that if we receive healing into our heart, or we receive truth into our heart, that it will be healing and it will be freedom to us because later on jesus comes and said you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free now knowing there is an experiential knowing it's not just a head knowledge knowing it's walking and out in your heart and this and it's a journey it has an inception there's progress and then there is attainment see i think sometimes where we get defeated in our thinking is that we think okay if i have a problem with something all right i'm gonna i'm gonna get some of god's word in me and then we expect that word to work like this immediately and i go okay I'm, i've kicked out the darkness i got the light i shine the light in and it's and it's gone but then we still have the same problem well see what god's saying is that there's an inception there's a starting point that we realize Something's going on here. Maybe it's the first time you, you've ever seen it in your life. That God shines his light on it. But then there's progress. It takes time. Progress takes time. Sometimes progress can be short. Sometimes it can be lengthy. It just depends on what you're dealing with and what God's doing with you. And then there's an attainment. There's a passing of the test that God brings you to a place that you have freedom in your heart like you've never had it before. And you can look back and you go, wow, a year ago I was like that. And I see the work of God, even though in the midst of it, you couldn't see the Holy Spirit working. You couldn't see him bringing about the fruit. But then you look back and you're like, I, I, I can tell I'm a different person now. Now let me tell you this. Just because you have attainment doesn't mean that you'll never be tested in that again. Because the enemy will want to come and try to test you in it to see if he can get you to fall in that area again. But see, you have a greater strength there now. You've got freedom that you've never had before. And so the things that used to be a temptation, you can say much easier, no, I'm not going to be a part of that. And you can move on and continue to be free. Uh, just an example, say, say rejection. I've go, grown up with rejection um, for whatever reason. Um, you know, dad wasn't around. Uh, mom didn't care for me. So, so I feel like there's a, a sense of abandonment and rejection there. Okay, but I, I come to Christ and I begin to learn about his love for me. That his love, he's accepted me. He's graced me with grace. I don't have to do anything to earn his love anymore. And I just get to receive it. Well, see, there may be a part of me that, wow, that sounds really good. But there may be a part of me that, I, I, don't, I don't get that. I, I, don't, I don't feel that yet. H how can God love me? All right, what is happening there is that there's still some lie there. Because what happens when God speaks truth, he has to have something there that will resound back to him. Because, see, if God is there, if the receiver is all God, it's going to resound back to him. It, it, it's going to reverberate. It's going to resonate within this person. That it's like, yeah, you know, at one point in time in my life, I couldn't say that God is good all the time. But now I can freely say that God is good all the time because I've got a greater understanding of him. You see, 
And so if, you, if the word is coming and it doesn't resound with you, it doesn't resonate with you, then there's something there that has not yet been sanctified. There's some work of God there that still needs to take place. So it's striking a chord, but the chord is not being played clearly. Does that make sense? So, so it, it's coming to you. It, I, I understand it. It's really good, but yet there's a part of me that I have such difficulty receiving that from the Lord because I'm just not yet in that place. Because truth is a person first and foremost, and that's Jesus Christ. And if I am healed, and I've got Jesus and His Spirit in me fully in that place, and God speaks that truth to me, then I am able to fully accept that truth and embrace it and walk in it. But if there is still something in me, there's still some wounds from the past, there's still some things in my head that I haven't gotten straight yet, that thing will not completely resonate within me. I won't be able to put my hands around it and grasp it and walk in it yet. And then you know you just got some work to do. That the Holy Spirit has work to do in you. Because John 8.47 says this. Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees. And he says, He who is of God hears God's words. If you're of God, you'll hear God's words. Therefore, you Pharisees do not hear because you are not of God. You are not of God. So when God speaks, if all you have in you is God in that arena, then you will hear it and you'll be able to receive it. But if you've got something else mixed in there also, it'll strike but it won't strike with that clear, resounding sound in you. John 18.37 says, he said this, Jesus was talking to Pilate before he was about to get crucified, and he said this, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So if you're of the truth, if you're in Him, you'll hear the voice of God. Let's flip over to Luke chapter 4. And I want to read a passage here that explains or kind of highlights a little bit of this. This God speaking and there would be a resonation, uh, a resonating sound within the people. This is about Jesus. So it says, He came to Nazareth. That's His hometown, right? He grew up in Nazareth. He was a carpenter in Nazareth. He fixed people's tables. He uh, helped people, you know, put an addition on their house. That sort of thing, right? So they were used to seeing him, but they were used to seeing him do very natural things. Okay? But he comes back here in the power of the Spirit after the 40 days of temptation. So as his custom was, he went into the synagogue and on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord." Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And all the eyes, who, uh, and all, eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So this is the response of the people. So all bore witness to him. They were able, that bore witness actually means to confirm or to give testimony to. That what he was saying, God was giving him, God was basically loaning his spirit. Because see, no man comes to the Father except the Spirit draws him. So 
as sinners, we got to have some type of loaning of some receiving equipment, and God does that. God was doing that with them. They all gave witness to Jesus that this was incredible stuff that he was speaking because it wasn't like Chris Camille standing in the synagogue reading that thing or one of the rabbis standing up and reading. It was the truth himself come out of the desert full of the power of the Holy Spirit. It was a totally different feel to it. And they were able to pick it up. It said, all bore witness to him. And they marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? So, so they were confused. They were receiving something in the spirit. They were getting it. They were picking it up. But then their mind was going, this, this, this dude just worked on my table like six months ago. I mean, it had a broken leg and he fixed it. That's all I ever seen this guy do. He, he's worked with Joseph for, gosh, since he was, what, 14 years ago? I, I mean, I, I always see him in the synagogue. He's good that way. But see, he was very natural. Very natural. But they were picking up something in the Spirit. But it goes on to say, Jesus said this. He goes, you will surely say this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah. And when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land, but to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. These people were all just marveling at him. They bore witness to him. What now is being said here in this next verse? So all, we're talking about the same group of people, all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built so that they might throw him down over the cliff. They were trying to kill the man. Ten minutes earlier, they all bore witness to him. This man is saying great things. I don't completely understand it. And I don't understand it because this is Joseph's son. He just fixed my table six months ago. But man, this is really good stuff. And then he goes on. And then all of a sudden, those same group of people, they are so angry. I'm going to kill this guy. We're going to shove him. We're taking him right now. We're escorting you out of here and we're going to throw you off the cliff. And that's going to be the end of you. We're sick of you. What happened? What happened? He insulted them. He spoke the truth. He, he spoke the truth with gracious words. He was still speaking truth with the words that he just spoke. But he insulted them because he said that Elijah and Elisha went to the widow and went to Naaman. They're both Gentiles in Gentile regions. So their response was they were insulted because they were the chosen people of God. And how dare you come into this synagogue and begin to say things like that because God would not go to the Gentiles. God's going to come to the Jews. This is what we learn from it. We've got to remain humble. See, don't think that you're God's chosen in all things, the pride, the puff, because if you do, you may become frozen, and then you're God's frozen chosen, and you're no longer, pro you're no longer progressing. 
So see, we've got to remain humble with the things that are before us. The things that we know for sure, salvation, the blood of Jesus, the work of Jesus, all that stuff, we need to have conviction on and hold on to it tightly. Okay? But some of that stuff, it's like, well, you know, I don't know yet. I, I, I still need enlightenment. I, I still need illumination by the Holy Spirit here because I want to receive what God has for me. I want to receive the truth, more and more truth. Because if I can ingest more and more truth, more light and more healing is going to flow into me and into you. Amen? All right. Hallelujah. Incredible. The other thing is, is that truth is a person. I mentioned that earlier. But I want to go to 1 John 2.23 because, see, Jesus was the first one to become the truth in person. But we also are to have the Word of God clothed in our flesh, that we are to become truth. That it's not just an attribute of Jesus, or it's not just an attribute of His church, but we actually, it's embedded as God said in Psalm 51, 6, that it's embedded, He wants truth embedded deeply within the inward parts. That means it's going down into the heart. It's not that Chris Camille speaks truth. Yeah, that's a good thing that I speak truth. But it comes from a, a heart that has been uh, sanctified and set apart to truth. So we're going to 1 John 2, 23-27. And, and John, the, the background of this letter here is this. John wrote this letter because he was coming against the false teachers of his day, mainly those who are Gnostic. And the Gnostics said that there is a special knowledge that we have attained to, that it's not about the work of Jesus, it's this special knowledge that we have. And you can only get into the club and really be saved if you have this spe special knowledge. They believed that anything of matter, this sort of thing right here, okay, was evil. But the spirit was absolutely pure, and that's who we really were in the spirit. So, I could go out and do anything I wanted to with my flesh because my spirit was completely set apart to the Lord, and that's who I really was. So, what I did in the body didn't really matter. The other thing that they believed was that they believed that Jesus since he was divine, did not come in the flesh. He was a shadow. He was uh, uh, kind of like a, a ghost or something that you could see walking the earth, but he didn't have this flesh like we do. Okay, so, so, so they were really messed up in their teaching. And so John begins to write this letter to counteract all of that stuff. And he writes this. He goes, whoever denies the Son, and this is in 23, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. So you've you got to believe that the Son has come in the flesh. He who acknowledges, this, acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. And what you heard from the beginning abides in you. You will also abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, it sounds a lot like the Holy Spirit, right? And it's true and it's not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. John wasn't coming against the uh, teachers in the church. He was coming against teachers who were proclaiming false things. And he was saying, how do you recognize who a false teacher is? Well, he was saying that there's an anointing within you, the Holy Spirit that is within you, that abides in you as you abide in him. And he teaches you and leads you into all things and tells you the things that are true, that are true. 
and it's deep in you. So it's, you can't be shaken off course by these other things that these people are saying. And so it is with us that truth is a person, that there is an anointing that resides within us that is a part of us, that our spirit is one spirit with God's spirit, and that we are one. You know, many people would believe, oh, well, now we have the word of God, and it's true, we do have the word of God. But what happens when you get in a situation like Paul and Barnabas did in Acts 16, and they had a slave girl who was empowered by a spirit of divination, and she went around saying this for days upon end. She said, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim the way of salvation. She kept saying that over and over and over. Is that truth? Yes, that was very true. But was it in the right spirit? See, and it took Paul a few days to finally hone in on what was going on. I believe that Paul felt like something was wrong, something was off, but he didn't know exactly what it was and what was going on. And then finally, Paul turns around and says, you know, get out of her, you spirit. I bind you. And then she was freed from that moment on. There's an anointing within us that teaches us that truth is a person. At first, it's Jesus, but it's also us. The last thing I just want to say is that truth is a journey that needs to be walked out. Truth is a journey. 1 John 1, 6, earlier in this book, it says that if we have fellowship with Him, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Truth has to be walked out. If we are the embodiment of truth as Jesus Christ lives within us, then we have to begin to walk that truth out. That it's not just a philosophy, it's just not the way I think, but it's a person and he's living in me, and he's a part of me, and I'm a part of him, and so now we need to begin to walk truth out in our daily lives. The other thing is, is that it's also that truth in a, is a journey, it's a progression, once again. Jesus said this, he says in 16.12 of John, he said, I have many things to say to you, but you're unable to bear them right now. I don't know what he was going to say to him, but I do know that it was going to be truthful because he can only speak the truth. So what type of truth should you be ingesting right now? Well, where do you have a sense of, you know what, I can't receive all that right now. Is it, man, acceptance? That I, I don't really feel, feel accepted um, is it God's love? I can't receive His love. Whatever, whatever area that is, it seems like you have a hard time receiving that truth about yourself and about what God wants to speak to you. Because see, you may feel like, man, I'm all alone. I'm an orphan. I feel like in this situation, God, you're so far away and God's saying to you, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm not going anywhere. I'm walking with you, but, it, but, but you can't receive it. Eat some of that truth. Ingest some of that truth. What truth is God showing you? What truth is the Holy Spirit illuminating in your life right now? That maybe this just coming out of the blue and it's like, okay, th this is what I'm doing with you right now. Because see, he wants truth in the inward parts. He wants to free us and he wants to heal us so that he can continue to send us out and we can be purveyors of his truth, standard bearers of his truth. Because our country, our city, our state, this world needs more and more people that are bearing the truth of God. And as we can see by what Jesus went through, if you're living for the applause of a crowd, the crowd's very fickle. At one moment, the crowd was saying, wow, he's great. The next moment, he's saying, we're going to kill this guy. You've got to live for the applause of one. Because if you stake a stand for the truth, you're going to stick out 
like a sore thumb in this world. It's just plain and simple. It, it, I'm here to tell you the truth. It's not easy at times to stand in the truth. Because when you take a stand, you stick out. Anybody can follow the crowd. Anybody can blend in with the crowd and, and go their way. But God's looking for men and women and boys and girls. He's looking for the church to stand up in this hour and in this day and declare truth like never before, not in a haughty way, not in an ugly way, just present truth. You know what? Jonah walked through Nineveh preaching truth had one of the shortest messages ever. Forty more days, and Nineveh's going to be overthrown. Forty more days, and Nineveh's going to be overthrown. Walked through Nineveh, a city of 120,000 people. Took him three days to get across from one side to the next, proclaiming truth. But God was on the truth. Because when it hit the hearts of the people, there was a godly reverence, a fear that came upon them that said, you know what, when a king heard it, I, I think he just heard it through the grapevine. I don't even think he heard it from Jonah. When he heard it, we need to, we need to repent. We need to get in sackcloth and ash, ashes here. Not only us, but our cattle and our sheep and boys and girls. And we're going to, maybe God, here, here's a Gentile, a guy that's lost, Maybe God will relent and have mercy on us. See, you never know when you take a stand and you speak up for the truth what God's going to do. That's his business. But because Jonah eventually did what he was supposed to do, a city of 120,000 people were saved. That generation. And I believe that God is going to bring that same type of anointing upon those who will take a stand for truth. That we will see people that will rise up to be able to speak to our nation, speak to our country in different places, and in different venues, and we're going to see an anointing that it's not going to be like the preaching of the past, but it's going to be a preaching that carries the presence of of Jesus in such a way that truth will go forth and it will be received by the people and that there will be great repentance. That's what I believe. That's just a criticism right there. Let's pray tonight, guys. Father, I thank you tonight uh, that, Lord, that you are wakening up your church and you're wakening up your people in this day and in this hour. Father, because, Lord, you've got a plan and a purpose that you are carrying out, that you are building a spiritual house, not for us, but for yourself. And so, Lord, we're so privileged to be a part of that. And yet, at the same time, Father, and it's an incredible uh, responsibility and weight, but, Lord, we thank you that we don't bear that alone, that we are in uh, yoke with you, and Lord, I just pray, Father, for all of us, Lord, that, God, that we would be lovers of your truth. That, Father, that we would want truth deep in the inward parts. That, Lord, that you would help us to feed on and to ingest and digest truth like never before, Lord. That, Father, that you, uh, God, even hard places, even hard places that people have tried to uh, different things that have been stubborn. It's been stubborn places uh, that haven't want to move, uh, hasn't want to, uh, uh, ch to be changed. Uh, but Lord, I, I just believe that there is truth. Lord, flood that area with Your light. Let Your truth come in, Lord God. And that, Father, the sanctifying, powerful work of the Holy Spirit would come and that there would be just great healing and freedom in the hearts of those who need it, especially, Lord, in that area where there's been a stubbornness. It's been a hard place. It's been something that hasn't, want to, hasn't wanted to go. I just proclaim 
blessing and freedom over you in Jesus' name. So God, we thank you. And I pray, Father, that as you work in us, that, Father, that you would give us the grace and the courage to be a people, Father, who will just stand up, walk the truth, speak the truth, Lord God, as you direct us, as you lead us, not in an arrogant uh, attitude or a haughtiness or it's my agenda, but, Lord, that we just walk hand in hand with the Spirit of God and let your will be done, just like your will was done with Jonah. We don't know what you would have uh, as far as your work is concerned. But Lord, help us to be filled with grace and courage to speak truth and to stand for truth when you're asking us to. Lord, I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. That's it. Fellowship. Got some food. Ice cream. Although it might be a little cold for some people in here. My wife who's got a sweatshirt on, she's still cold. <laughs> we'll see you on Sunday. Bless you. Have a good one.